it's really a, a, a remarkable thing. Um, I've been with the orchestra, uh, this is my, my 11th year uh, conducting the orchestra, uh, and I've seen um, incredible growth in those 11 years, but if you can imagine, in 1976, the, I think, 35 people that got together to say, let's just read music. And uh, an orchestra that was just a, let's get read, just read music, soon realized they wanted to get together and play concerts. And now we have a concert season. We play uh, nine to 10 different performances. Um, I think uh, this next year, the only month we have off is June. So also, everyone in the musicians are going, oh my gosh, we're really busy. <laughs> Uh, tonight's concert, we, uh, and the, the pre-concert talk has a slightly different format. Um, obviously, I have a couple of, of guests up here. Um, and the concert itself is a concert that has music that you would be um, not surprised to find at an orchestra concert, music by Edvard Grieg, and music, music by Richard Strauss, but also a brand new piece of music, a world premiere. And I thought, what a better way to start the 40th anniversary uh, season than to do a brand new piece of music, a brand new piece of art. And one of the things we do at the Salt Lake Symphony is uh, make sure that we foster Utah talent. And so Philip Bidstein, who is uh, our composer, uh, is, is here with us tonight. And he is here with us at many concerts. He actually sits here for, for many of the lectures. Yeah. Uh, it's it's great, to, great to see you on this side of the... Yeah. You get to talk more than I do today. That's, that's really, really great. So, uh, so we, we will be talking largely about uh, that piece and the creation of that piece. And um, we have a, uh, a, another guest with us tonight who can give us some insight into what the, the music and the inspiration of the music uh, is kind of about from the perspective of where that inspiration and where the tradition comes from. And um, I know him as Professor Jerry Gardner of the Department of Theater, but he is uh, also known as uh, Rinpoche. He is uh, the uh, leader of the uh, Tibetan community, uh, spiritual community here in Salt Lake City. And it's fantastic to have uh, both of these gentlemen with me. So would you please welcome them. <laughs> So the other two pieces on the program I'll just briefly mention are um, pieces very much in the Western tradition and uh, are very much pieces about in the individual, the ego, if you will, the, the person. We're starting with the uh, a suite of uh, four pieces by Edvard Grieg, which was written as incidental music to Henrik Ibsen's play, Peer Gint. And this is music that is probably in the, at least in the top 20 of the classical hit parade. You're going to say, oh, I know that one, and I know that one. Uh, because it is music that's been used in everything from Halloween types of things to margarine commercials. So you'll, 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 you'll hear that music, and you will, will recognize it. But the music itself um, represents and it, it, uh, the, the kind of story of an individual that doesn't really get it. It's an individual who's an impetuous youth who goes out and supposedly he's going to conquer the world and leave all of the things he should be paying attention to aside. Um, that doesn't really come out in the music very well. It comes out very well in the play, if you've ever uh, seen the play or even read the play. Um, the piece on the other side of this um, is the piece we're going to end with, which is Death and Transfiguration. In German, it's known as Tod und Verklärung. That sounds even more ominous, doesn't it? Uh, Death and Transfiguration is a tone poem by Richard Strauss, which uh, depicts, it, it sounds like it's, it's a really depressing thing, but it's, it's actually one of the most glorious pieces of music ever written. It depicts the, uh, the concept of the individual fighting death. Someone, as music starts very softly, you hear the heartbeat, you hear the breath musically depicted. And then you hear at the, um, at, at the uh, middle section a great fight, a fight with death, saying no, no, no. And then uh, a kind of reflection of this person's life. At the end, finally, when the battle is over and the person has accepted death, there is this great unending cadence. And that, that sounds like an oxymoron. A cadence is something that's supposed to end. But the, the piece never really ends. Don't worry, you'll get a chance to go home tonight. 
But it's one that just keeps building and building and rising and rising, and you realize there's more and more and more levels of, of, of realization and, and, and uh, at, at the, the end, as Richard Strauss uh, mentioned. I'll just give you one little anecdote about this. Uh, when Richard Strauss himself, in 1949, was on his deathbed, wrote the piece in the late 1880s, so it had been a number of decades. Um, he was struggling, as many people do at the end of their life, and opened his eyes, his daughter was by his bedside, and he said, you know, dying is just as I wrote it in Death and Transfiguration. <laughs> that is also an expression of the individual when you think about it. Strauss was saying, I was right, you know? I was right. <laughs> so. But the, the centerpiece of the evening is this new piece of music uh, that was written by Philip. And Philip is, no, uh, again, I say he was been in our audience. He's also no stranger to our stage. Um, how many years ago was Secret Gift? Is that four or five? Three. Three or four years ago, um, we did a piece with Philip at Christmas time that Philip was um, inspired to write after he read the book uh, A Secret Gift by Ted Gupp. And this was a piece of music that he wrote for orchestra, for chorus, and for his uh, group known as Red Rock Rondo. And we premiered that on our stage here at Libby Gardner Hall. And so I thought it was interesting, and Philip, we can maybe start with this, the fact that uh, that was a piece, The Secret Gift, about a gift, hmm. uh, about a series of gifts. And this is a piece of music that is written as a gift. This was a piece of music that you wrote for, uh, for your partner and longtime friend, uh, Charlotte Bell, who is our soloist tonight. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about that, and we'll get going and talk about the piece a bit. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to Dr. Baldwin and the Salt Lake Symphony for performing their piece tonight. Uh, it's just a, quite an honor to be performed by his orchestra. Um, yeah, I hadn't made that connection to a secret gift, but this, uh, the idea for this piece that you're going to hear tonight started about almost two years ago, I think in October, when I was going for a walk by myself and I had this, I, this idea struck me that it's Charlotte's birthday a year and a half from then, which was now last May, that it was going to be her 60th birthday. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to write a concerto for her for her 60th birthday? And then a few minutes later on this walk, I had another thought, which was, and I know what it'll be about. It'll be about the Brahma Viharas, which are practices which we're going to hear more about from Tutsin and from Rinpoche, um, that they are practices that are central to her life and that she practices and teaches. And there happen to be four of them. So I thought, great, four movements, because actually the piece ended up being a little bit more like a symphony with a featured solo part than it is a concerto. Uh, but that was the idea, and that's how it started, and I, I presented it. I first asked Charlotte if it was okay, because I couldn't do this in secret. And then I asked Bob uh, if he would be willing to perform it, and we put it on the schedule. And, oh, and I should add that we went on a retreat. Charlotte goes on many retreats, long, silent retreats, and I've gone on a few. We went on one together a year ago to Spirit Rock Meditation Center in California in the Brahma Viharas and Vipassana, a related meditation technique. And uh, it was right after that, when I came back last August, that I started composing the piece. Great. Um, it's interesting um, that you uh, started out, and I remember having many discussions with uh, Philip about what is this piece going to be. And from the beginning, you were um, you were uh, confused with the title uh, concerto because that you knew that that's sort of the idea of a soloist in an orchestra, but it didn't quite fit what you were trying to say uh, through the music. And so, if you um, on your program, you'll notice that the. Um, there's the Brahma Viharas, and then there's a colon, and the, the subtitle of the piece is a meditation for English horn and orchestra. Um, and I think that um, that's one of those, those words, and, and perhaps Rinpoche, you can uh, talk a little bit about this concept of, of meditation. And the, you, you think that perhaps you're going to hear music that is uh, only um, uh, soft and, and um, kind of ethereal, uh, and that for 35 minutes we're going to be floating or something like this. And it's a very different experience if you think about what, what meditation is. Yeah, to pick up on it, I wanted to clarify, um, I have many hats, but in this uh, particular incident, uh, it's just Rinpoche or Tupin Rinpoche. And in actuality, I'm the resident teacher of Urban Sanctum Lane, which is a Buddhist uh, gampo or temple center located here in Salt Lake City. So that's just my capacity. But it's interesting, uh, 
Philip and I have known and passed each other over the last several years um, and talked about either doing some type of dance piece or collaboration. And then I've also worked with Rob in the music uh, department doing movement things, also connected, um, uh, doing workshops for conductors and workshops for music, um, musicians. But in this case, the uh, Brahma Baharas really is a concept that we find that the word Brahma Baharas can be translated out as the four measurables. But really, it should be said as the four enlightened measurables. But the reason we put enlightened there, because these concepts were not really presented, at least by the Buddha, until after he had obtained the, the state of complete enlightenment. So everything that he teaches thereafter is the enlightened four noble truths, the uh, enlightened uh, four immeasurables, uh, the enlightened Prajnaparamitas. But really, this concept of the four immeasurables we can find all the way back in the Rigvedas or the Vedantas, or even in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Bhagavad Gita um, we find these concepts. But in terms of a music score or, or a theater piece, you have a beginning, a middle, an end, and then there's a uh, conclusion, or there may be the uh, prologue. So it's sort of apropos that it should have those four qualities. But as we were talking in the, uh, in the uh, office, we have, and it's sometimes it's uh, put in different orders, but we have the Theobada school, the, uh, or Hinayana, then you have the Mahayana school, the Bodhisattva aspect, and then we have the Vajrayana. The um, four immeasurables, or the Brahma Vaharas, are right in the middle of what's known as the Mahayana school, or the school of great compassion, the school of the Bodhisattva. And those four can be listed as sometimes compassion, loving kindness, uh, joyousness, and equanimity, or they may put loving kindness first, which you have in your concept. Um, but really, it says the equanimity should come first, because if you don't have the equanimity, then you really, how can you go about truly saying that? And it's also, it says, boundless or vastness immeasurables, meaning that there is no measure to the level of compassion, no level to, uh, or boundless or limit to any of those four qualities. They must include all sentient beings of all realms of samsara. And as we were saying in the office, when we think of these things in this type of music, that we're going to sort of be floating along, and I make the joke, you're going to be in California by the poolside, drinking iced tea, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Not really. Compassion um, has a dual quality. It can be very peaceful, and it can be very strongly or wrathful. All of you who are parents and you have children, I'm sure you understand this concept. <laughs> the main thing is you love them regardless, but sometimes you have to tell them no. And sometimes you have to tell them in a very strong way. And sometimes, as my dad say, you just have to bring your foot down. But you still love them. So that is the compassionate, wrathful side. So each one of those has that dual aspect. And I think just looking at the score, I can see how uh, Philip had written, there are some very soothing parts, but there are also some very energetic parts that I think denotes uh, both of those aspects. Mm -hmm. So, and what I'm trying to do is, you make sure you cut me off, because I'll yeah, tell no, you I way more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. I would yeah. this super fantastic. Um, the, you know, the other aspect of it, when you're, you're dealing with uh, material, if we want to make a, a line, which I'm not sure is really there, but, but perhaps is between Eastern and Western thought, um, many times you think you're going to get a piece that somehow sounds Eastern, that the orchestra is going to, going to, to play uh, music that sounds like it's from, from India or from, uh, from an, another Eastern culture. And Philip, has, you've not done this, um, although there are some elements um, that, I, that I hear in the music uh, that I can say, oh, I can say you're, you, are, you are being imitative of, of this and you do use a poly chant to open the piece, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's, maybe you can start there. I remember when we first were talking about this, there were gonna be five movements, do you remember that? I don't. You don't? <laughs> <laughs> the poly chant, the introduction. I've got, I've got it on the couch. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> we'll have a half an hour to rehearse it. <laughs> I just finished. But, but you, start, you chose to, to, to start the piece with this chant, which is a, um, a quotation. Of, uh, of music from somewhere else. Yes. And, and so, I can yeah, sure. Uh, but yeah, but, but let me just answer yeah. your question in general. Um, it, it, it's not an Eastern piece, uh, and I decided early on, I did the same thing like 20 years ago. I did a piece based on a Native American uh, uh, political issue, and I decided I don't want to write a Native American 
music, you know, sound, like I'm trying to write Native American music. Right. Same thing with this, I didn't want to try to write an Eastern sounding piece. And besides, these qualities are universal. Exactly. And, and, and I wanted to try, and I speak in my language, which is in the music. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I've been a punk rocker as well. But in, in, this, in this setting, I'm a, I'm a Western classical music guy. So I've written sort of, I don't know what you call it, neo romantic or something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, it's a language that you, you're, you'll be familiar with. Um, and yeah, it does start, but, and there are a few elements, like the polychant and also the second movement starts off. If you've hear, heard in Tibetan music, a lot of times there's these clanging cymbals and these deep uh, horns. And, and the second movement does start with a taste of that. And I, and I just put that in for my own enjoyment. But, um, but, uh, Which are actually very effective. <laughs> very, the, 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 you, you'll hear the bass trombone unlike you've ever heard the bass trombone. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the, uh, when I was on that uh, retreat a year ago with Charlotte, in the evening, uh, it was with Joseph Goldstein, for those of you who uh, know, and a uh, great teacher, and, and several other teachers, Camilla Masters, and, you know, but there was one guy named Greg Sharp who lead, led us in a chant at night, and, um, and it was like this. Uh, I, I'm going to play, I'm already going to change a little bit by adding this sort of string. It was a very simple thing. Uh, it's, in, it's in my right hand, which is over here. So it's like this. Uh, <laughs> throughout the piece, and there's that one, and then the um, compassion theme, which you hear early on in this little introduction to the first movement. You hear the violin go. It's a sort of reaching, yearning thing, those three notes. And, and then I combine it with the chant by going sort of like this. section, um, these uh, strings uh, start doing, I can't really play exactly, it's sort of this sort of feeling. And then you'll hear like echoes of the, the, that poly chant has this little two note thing at the beginning of it. And I play with that a lot throughout the whole piece. And so in the, in the compassion movement, you hear this. So I, I add a note there. And then Charlotte comes in on the English horn with the compassion theme. joy that you feel in response to the joy and happiness and success that others have. And so I, I went lighthearted with that same theme that now it's like this. Tipton or Rinpoche, I think, it's great to think that you could start with, um, with that, uh, you know, and I can see how that could be a grounding for everything. Exactly. But equanimity is sort of a balance and evenness that you keep amongst life's joys and sorrows, that no matter, it's sort of like being at the, maybe you can visualize like being at the bottom of the ocean, you're the, I mean, not us being at the bottom of the ocean because then we drown, but if you were, if you were the bottom of the ocean, and there were storms on top, and the water was roiling, and the winds were roiling, but you're still, still at the bottom of the ocean. So that for me is this. And I, I sat down and played this D-flat chord with an A-flat in the bottom, and I just let it ring, and, I, and listen to it in the silence, and how you hear these little other tones kind of come out as, it, as the sound decays. I 
and other sounds. So I tried to do that in the orchestra by having this, the different sections kind of come and fade. And, uh, and also I try to illustrate sort of a, a pluralistic thing by uh, uh, stacking chords on top of each other like this. So, uh, so that's a few of the themes in the piece. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> A couple of things, like uh, Rock mentioned, uh, the use of what we call the Romo and Silni, uh, and also the use of the uh, a long horn. And mm -hmm. these two instruments, and there's several others that are used in the Tibetan uh, uh, configuration, but they really are music um, of offering and invocation. Um, one is if you were to hear the sound like of thunder, or the sound of rain, or the sound of the elephant. Um, which are symbols of offering uh, to the enlightened ones or to the Buddhas. But these four qualities, when we hear them in terms like words like Brahma, Bahara, we think, oh, this is some Sanskrit word, which it is, but these are not necessarily Sanskrit terms, the same as you would hear in the music. These are universal qualities. And again, like I like to tell the students, regardless of what the prophet or enlightened person spoke, they really were talking about our humanity and our humanness and how we may arrive to the height of that. And what better way in order to that to occur is through, through music. Music, we know, is a universal language. That sustained chord that you hear reminded me immediately, and back to equanimity, that sustained aspect is the quality that we all have, that calm abiding and direct insight, or our own wisdom and knowledge, that sustains whether we're able to recognize it or not. And I think Philip is bringing that forth uh, in his work. On top of that, we hear, I was just reading prior coming, we hear the matter. Matter is the obstacles or phenomena as it presents itself in our daily life. And so we hear that on the, on the top, but underneath there is this base, what we call the primordial wisdom or primordial ground from which everything arises. So there's so many things that it's not, whether it's Eastern or Western, those things are irrelevant, merely dualistic conceptualization, as we say. But it's the universality of the concept and the universality of the music that we want to uh, connect to. So this, anyway, this is what I was That's saying. Great. I've sometimes heard that referred to as the perennial philosophy also, something that you can find at the, the base of, of, of so many different traditions. Base concept, base conceptual network, or matrix. We know the movie. Yeah, matrix. So. <laughs> What, um, I, what is, is interesting to me is when um, we're dealing with, um, and, and we won't want to get too, too often to the, the, the concept of form, but Philip had to choose certain forms in order to, to present this. It's a piece that has four movements. That, that was easy to do because there are four qualities. Um, but it also is a, a symphonic form. There has to be a certain uh, kind of concept of it to make it work for a symphony orchestra. And there's the form itself of a symphony orchestra, and I'm thinking of that D-flat chord, uh, that the orchestra had trouble with that. Um, not that it's difficult in any kind of technical way, but to get what you were going for there. Uh, he orchestrated it in such a way where we've got these chords, and then other instruments come in before the, the, uh, the, the first instruments die out and then they die out and then you become aware that these other sounds are sounding and then finally the strings come in and it's kind of, it goes brass woodwind strings if I, if I remember each of those correctly. Yeah. And, and that, that, that concept too of, of that there's a lot more there than you think, than, than initially you think. Now I, I think uh, another composer might have just had everybody sound the chord and then drop, drop things out and then, then you, you realize things are going. But the fact that you really are paying attention to the brass sound, and the woodwinds have snuck in, and then exactly. you realize, oh, <laughs> did I get it? Oh, exactly. Okay. The word. They, 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 they sneak in. So got that woodwind sneak in. <laughs> um, but what some of the the issues I think we have um, when we we talk about um, all of this is we do put things into into certain forms, and and we we then uh, perhaps lose some uh, aspect of, because of, of, of assumption. The assumption that you're going to a symphony concert and you're gonna hear music of a certain type. 
Um, this does not sound, by the way, Philip's music, and you can tell just by him playing a little bit, it does not sound like Richard Strauss or Ludwig von Beethoven or, or other composers that you would think. It doesn't, sorry. <laughs> You're the modern Beethoven. There, there, there are ego issues working with composers. <laughs> Very fragile. But I, I wonder if, if Philip, maybe uh, you and Rinpoche can talk just a little bit about that, uh, the, the concept of, of you have to present this, uh, any material, in a, in a certain form that is an expected form, whether it's a book or a symphony, or, and, and those forms can aid you, but they can also, you can make uh, you know, perceptive uh, mistakes by just assuming it's going to be something. Start? Sure. Yeah. I think maybe first start with what are the four immeasurables or the abominable habits? Um, and the word Brahma, meaning uh, uh, also we know as great uh, or magnificent, and uh, Vaharas can be translated somewhat as meaning the knowledge. So if we put those two together, obviously the knowledge of greatness. Wherein does lie the knowledge of greatness? That knowledge lies within each and every one of us or so each and every ascension being. Um, and each person based on where they find themselves are able to access um, this pool of knowledge that lies within. But if we go with the first one, loving kindness can simply be said, it is having the uh, great desire or immeasurable desire that all sentient beings have the cause of happiness, the result of happiness, and that they're never separated from that experience. So the loving kindness, so you wish that everyone has the quality of happiness, including oneself. Then, so that would be loving kindness. But then the concept of compassion is not a concept of having pity. Um, that is not, it's not dynamic, it doesn't move us. But if we have the concept of compassion, it's having the desire that not one individual has the cause or the result of suffering and that each and every individual never meets or is always separated from the causality and the resultant there of suffering. Then the next one we have is joyousness, and Rob pointed out, joyousness is one, is having the joyous attitude toward all sentient beings and whatever they may encounter. So we put it in context of our everydayness, someone uh, gets a present, or they get a new job, or when they have a baby, or they're getting married, etc. We find great joy in that. But at the same time, we should not have uh, contempt or have some negative attitude because someone else is getting something that we didn't. It's like I tell the students sometime, when the stock market goes up and Bill Gates makes more money, then be quite joyous. <laughs> but then there's another component that we want to have there and that one is to offer. So the joyousness in each one of those components, you're also making an offering of those qualities. The last one is said to be equanimity. And equanimity is to have a feeling that regardless of who it may be, you exercise the first three thereupon. So therefore, really, the equanimity should come first. Else, the other three are sort of tainted with a dualistic fixation or grasping quality which means they're no longer boundless or immeasurable. So equanimity is where there's a practice, a great uh, Shantideva, uh, Indian Pandita. He says, first, I want you to think of how you feel about your mother. Everyone loves their mother um, or your sister, or even sometimes people say you love your dog more than you love your parents. So wherever you can find that which you love, then expand that. Now let's go over here and let's look at the one it's like if you live in New York City, you look through the peephole, there's a landlord, don't want to see that guy, don't like him or her. I want you to have equanimity, the same love for mother, have for this person that you label as enemy. Then we have over here the one who we might say indifference toward, or we don't know them, even the, neighbor, the, the, the person who lives down the street, you really don't know them, but you should have the same love for mother, same love for that, and now expand those to those three people, and then expand them out so that everyone is under that umbrella of equanimity. Then from the state of equanimity, then we can employ those other three in an immeasurable and the boundless fashion. So that has to be there first. The next part is that if you're only looking at, okay, I'm uh, very peaceful and very kind and very caring um, in each one of those, then you have negated the other side, which is also the need sometimes to be very strong and to be very wrathful. Sometimes we have a, now, in the last 30 years, tough love. 
It's still love, but it may be very direct and very forceful as opposed to very kind and very peaceful. So each one of those also has that quality. And, and then there's six more things which I'm not going to go into, which is called the Prajnaparamita, which also must attach to those. So when the Buddha taught, first uh, the four uh, uh, enlightened noble truths came forth, then next was the Eightfold Noble Path uh, came forth, then was the four uh, uh, immeasurable truths, and then was the path or the methods of meditation called shamatha or vipassana by which one uh, uh, goes through that. Listening to that sustained note is the meditation. And then he said the, the, the woodwinds creep in. Sneak in. Sneak in. They sneak in. <laughs> so that's like our thoughts. We have a primordial ground of calm and peacefulness, and on top of that, unbeknownst to us, there's always something creeping in to distract us and take us in odd ways, right? And in looking at the score, just really quickly, oh, he's quite clever, this uh, composer. <laughs> he's really teaching you meditation, and meditation has nothing to do with the East or the West or with the Buddha or with the Jesus or any of those great prophets. It is something that is innate to our human spirit, and I think, look, again, looking at the score briefly, the music arrives from the innate quality of our primordial mind. Mm. Right? So, I'm just... That's oh, good. Okay, I see what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this, did I catch, your, catch what you wanted? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and, and, well, thank you. And, uh, very perceptive. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope it sounds as good as it looks. <laughs> yeah, it looks good. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, this, but as far as form, you know, from a musical perspective, um, first of all, I may not look like it, but I'm a pretty formal guy. <laughs> when it comes to music, uh, and I, I see some of my students here, we talk a lot about form. And, um, but, but I like loose form. I mean, I, I think things have to be put in a vessel for things to be understood, whether you're communicating, whether you're communicating a concept, or, you know, a, a musical concept. It's got to have some sort of thing that, that holds together. And so each of the four movements has a form, but it's a fairly through-composed form in the sense of, uh, I didn't like say it's going to be a certain form to begin with, but like you know, there tends to be something that starts, that returns at the end of the movement because I like that sort of cyclical aspect. Sure. But in response to uh, what Rinpoche is saying about these qualities and how equanimity also actually ought to be first or can be first or it's different okay. first in different order, different traditions. It speaks to me that there's sort of a fluidity there between <coughs> these concepts. They're not each one in its own silo. Each one affects the other. Exactly. Each one can be uh, practiced in, in, sometimes the practice of one f filters in, sneaks in to, <laughs> to the uh, practice of the other. And, and so in a way, I did that with my music by having these themes, like the little ones I showed you and some others that come back in different forms. So like the loving kindness form, uh, theme or the compassion theme isn't only just in the compassion movement, it's also occurring in the loving kindness movement because Compassion is in loving kindness as well. So, uh, right. so the form has that. Uh, I, I hope you know has that fluidity of having the concepts be in different aspects of the form. And, and I think from a musical uh, standpoint, um, what it does is it reminds us, just like we always need these reminders in life, that oh, that's right. I I I'd forgotten. I'd forgotten this was important mm. uh, because those little thoughts had kind of taken some of that away. And, and that, that's what, what happens in, in, in Philip's piece, but it's what happens with a lot of uh, uh, pieces of music that are longer than the typical three minute slot that we get for you know, popular music, um, is that you do have to have certain elements and composers have always found that it's a, they'll use a rhythm or a motive or a melody um, that really has nothing to do with the form itself to say that I'm writing in a sonata allegro form that has been stamped for 250 years of approval uh, that all composers will, will write symphonies that, that are like this. Um, but there are other things that bring it back, and sometimes it can be very subtle. Um, and sometimes it's, it's only an interval. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, a, um, it, it's an instrument that is uh, familiar in a way that is playing something a little different. And, and I would, um, to, to risk saying the orchestra is something that it's not, I do see the orchestra as and an organism that, that often, when it is working at its best, which by the way, tonight the Salt Lake Symphony is, um, it really embodies all of this. Um, there is, is great compassion, there is great loving kindness, there is um, empathetic joy that your colleagues 
um, have just played an amazing solo that are said, not your solo, but that was, boy, I've, I've never heard the trumpet played quite, quite that beautifully at that, at that particular moment. He's, he's, yeah, I'm, so, I'm so pleased for that. And in the end, it does provide a, sor a certain kind of equanimity around the entire stage and around the entire work. I would, I would uh, kind of put forward just the, the, the hypothesis that that's what makes an orchestra work. Because when you look at the orchestra, it, is, it should not work. You have a, a disparate elements of instruments that were geared to play outside, inside, loud instruments, soft instruments, all kinds of things that were never meant to go together. And just like humankind, all of a sudden we find ourselves together and having to work in a, in a certain way. So um, see if that works tonight. I think it's going to work perfectly. Um, even when it doesn't work perfectly, it's amazing to me how 90 musicians can get off the rails and right back on the rails because they help each other out. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable, and so many times they say, wow, the conductor, it's amazing that you did that. I didn't do anything but just sort of think, please. <laughs> so I um, wanted to have a little bit of time uh, for questions from, from you, because we, we, this is a different format, and uh, you might have heard some things that you would um, like um, uh, either clarification on, or maybe it, it kind of uh, spurred a question of uh, either composition or uh, something that Rinpoche said. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and take take a few minutes and see if anyone has any any questions. Yes. Um, it, the the title sounds a little bit Hindu to me. And it's Sanskrit. What, so what um, overlapping of Hindu and Buddhism is there? Well, the title is, as I said, uh, Brahma, because we know that you had the caste system. Right. The Brahma was the highest, so Brahma means all-knowing, magnificent, etc. But it's not Hindu per se. Um, it because the Hindu tradition, what became known as Hindu, didn't, wasn't, didn't come into a, a later development, but from Pali, which you mentioned that there's a Pali chant. So Pali is one of the first languages, first written languages that we know come in India, and then from Pali, then it goes to Sanskrit. So this is a Sanskrit title, when it is uh, translated, means um, the four immeasurables, or the four boundless immeasurables, is, what, is really what it's saying. So it does sound Hindu, but if we don't know Sanskrit, and we don't know Pali, then we don't see how the Sanskrit came into being. And, and from Sanskrit, again, we have all these various other languages because you spoke in German. Mm -hmm. And we can see a correlation between German language and between uh, uh, Sanskrit. Sanskrit is really a base language, along with Pali and several others. So that's, yes, that's why it has that connotation. Yes? Yeah, sorry, do you uh, just Thinking about things, uh, do you feel that music is itself uh, a living thing and that uh, what you're actually trying to do is present an example of a living thing which maybe if it's not in life, it's aspiring to it? Well, thank you. I think it is, music is, a, yeah, it's, I mean, you know, maybe we all have an answer to that, but it's, uh, to me, it's definitely a living thing. Uh, it's vibration. Uh, you know, it has a physical vibration to it and it moves through our bodies. And I believe, in a way, we are all, you know, kind of creating music uh, with our bodies and with our actions. Music is the kind of music that we're going to hear tonight with structure, played by instruments, and is often entertaining, etc. But music, I think, also is just the sounds of nature and the sounds in the world. And um, I believe there's a lot of relationships between those sounds and, uh, and music and and the way in which we relate to each other as people that are still waiting to be learned and discovered. Yeah, and I, I would add to that, um, I always uh, think it was interesting when I was a, a, a student, uh, my conductors or my teachers would always say, now do you have your music? You know, before I go on stage or something, do you have your music? And then what they meant was the sheet music. There's actually, even though Rinpoche said that he could look at this, and that's because he is a musician and he could see relationships and, and imagine sound things, there's actually no music in that piece of paper. The music is, it's a representation of the sounds you're going to make. And so it, it, it's a creation and perhaps a recreation of musical ideas that, that someone else put down, just like a reading of a poem would be, uh, if I were to read a, a Mary Oliver poem, that's not Mary Oliver reading it, it's my, I have my own interpretation, my own voice, my own inflection that I'm going to give that, but it, it's, it's someone else's ideas, but I am, I am creating that in the moment. Um, I, I think that that's very much uh, what most musicians 
realize when they get to a certain level of beyond of, you know, where do I put my finger to get an F sharp and, and things like that. And that comes relatively soon. Um, and young Suzuki kids who play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, there is something with that where they don't have to think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And they have this, this, this moment where they, they can just play and express that. You, you will see that those, there's an incredible joy in those, those children uh, that, are, that are playing that music, arguably in a simple technical level, but I don't think that makes it any less meaningful uh, than a Strauss tone poem uh, in, on, a, on a certain level. Maybe to, to add to what you're asking also, um, again, listening to, to Philip, is, and what you were saying, Adam, as long as you're contemplating the four measurables, then they're not boundless, nor are they immeasurable. And if you're only playing the music, only playing the notes on the paper, it's not music. The moment you transcend the conceptual base, then it becomes music, and then it becomes also boundless. So the idea is to start with structure and then move to the improvisational or non-form aspect. So when we're no longer contemplating what a particular piece of music um, is imparting, then there is this visceral quality that seeps into the bones. You don't understand it intellectually, but you feel it throughout your whole being. And from what little I know of, of Philip and was talking to him, I, I think that's what he's trying to convey in this gift to his partner through this reason. And let's let that happen tonight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Feel it in your bones and let it transcend. <laughs> Well, I told you about the yeah, I told you about the D flat chord. I don't know why it was a D flat chord, but I sat down on my piano and that's the chord I played and I stuck with it. So and, <laughs> with an A flat on the bottom, which makes it which interesting. It sort of makes it slightly unstable. It doesn't sound unstable to you, but to a music theoretician, it's slightly unstable because it doesn't have D flat at the bottom. And I and, and I, I don't think I thought this at the time, but I, but I analyzing it after the fact, I think that's perfect for equanimity because equanimity is essentially uh, ideally stabilizing, but it but it is also unstable because. Uh, there's probably very few of us who can remain in a state of equanimity all the time. So, uh, so therefore, I thought that's good. That's good. It's a deep sound. But uh, so that that's where the D flat came from. But uh, I don't know about the other movements. Uh, if I, I I didn't do it intellectually. I don't think I sat down and thought like a certain key fits. I just started improvising because that's the way I compose. I sat down at the piano. I'd come back from this retreat. Uh, and I'd meditate a little while, recapture what I was experiencing on the retreat of the Brahma Viharas, try to, you know, try to cultivate a feeling of loving kindness, and I'd put my hands in the piano and see what came out. And a lot of that stuff in the first week or two after the retreat, I kept. Uh, and then I had to spend many, many months articulating that and spreading it out and, you know, tweaking it and all sorts of things. But I, I'd say it sort of, sort of came, you know, uh, just out of a feeling of sitting at the piano and feeling those qualities. And, and, and I, I would add, that's a very good question. Um, looking at things, uh, you must be a music student, if you, if you mention music theory, uh, because music theory is something that we study here at, at college, I teach here, and there's, there are all, kind, all kinds of classes. Um, and it, it sounds like it's a theory, and it, it really, in a way, it is. It's trying to explain what already exists. And um, mu music theory, rather than a theory of something that might exist, maybe there's a D-flat chord. Uh, no, we know there's a D-flat chord, and we're trying to explain how it functions. And we find certain practices uh, that many composers in certain styles will, will use. I think what, what composers um, often do is they find things that work, and then later you can discover, if, they're, if they work well, that they follow some of those rules. But the rules themselves were, were never written before something was created. Uh, then you end up getting you get, you get a paint-by-number kind of approach, uh, which is a nice picture, but maybe not a great work of art. 
Um, so there, there is an element of, of improvisation, I think, to every composition uh, that a composer is sort of finding, finding their way within their, within their particular language. So there was a question over here. Yes, in the blue. I was wondering, Philip, if you found spending as much time as you did composing this music, that you gained any new measurable insight about any one of these four immeasurables that you hadn't had previously? Well, the equanimity, I, I keep coming back to that. Uh, you know, it does sort of underlie everything. You know, another thing about equanimity is to not be, uh, you know, I forget if Rinpoche specifically said this, is to not become attached to your wishes. You wish for these things. You wish for uh, good health for yourself and others. You wish for joy, etc. But you don't become attached to the results of your wishes. And so I think, in a way, I had to be equanimous in not getting attached to the success or the potential failure, or whatever, of my piece. And so I had to uh, keep coming back to equanimity in a way to get through you know, the composing and not worry too much about it. So I'd say on that level. Because I gave him a deadline for certainly worrying about it. <laughs> and, I, and I was late. And he was late. <laughs> what, I think we have time for one more that the musicians do need to go get ready. So yes. Yes. Asana tradition, in the tradition that I practice here, when we often call them it's the four heavenly bones, is that the idea that you can't really think about them too much. If you think about them too intellectually, then you can't really feel them. There's this kind of heartfelt quality, and I love it when people talk about mindfulness and heartfulness together, because really they're the same, the heart and mind, you know, chitta, which is the word that's the same. So that like the intellect can get in the way if you think about it. So they're very intuitive, very heart moving. And I love that you said that. Well, thank you. And that is, that is a struggle for me because I do tend to think way too much. Uh, but, but uh, you know, writing, a, in response to both of your questions now, writing this, you, uh, you, you know, uh, Val asked if it made me think about one of the qualities more. But it sort of, it, it increased my love for Charlotte because you talk about heart and mindfulness, you know, and that's what she embodies and teaches me. And, uh, and, you know, it just, I just was always filled with, this is for Charlotte, this is something that she's going to get to play, and I, I felt so good to be able to, to do that, to write that for her. And I, I'll mention that getting Charlotte from her English horn second oboe chair up to the front of the orchestra was no easy task. <laughs> Charlotte is, is a, a, a wonderful player and, and a, in a supportive role, even though she's a very well-respected yoga teacher, of course, and, and is, is used to being in front of a class in that way. Uh, as far as uh, music is concerned, she thought that was not the place for her, this place of the spotlight, yes. right, uh, so, so to speak. And, um, and that was, was an interesting uh, experience. And, and I think it was, again, the concept is not really a concerto, but it's a meditation. It's a, um, it's a piece that has an, an obligato, in other words, a, a, a conversation with the orchestra yeah. that has a, a lot to do with that. So. that that's exactly it. It's, it ended up being like a dialogue with the yeah. orchestra. And I wrote a lot of solo, brief solo parts for other members of the orchestra, partially because it makes sense for the uh, intent of the piece, and partially so that Charlotte wouldn't feel like she was stealing the limelight from there. <laughs> so I, I would like to, um, first of all, thank you. This is a great turnout. Um, I don't know that we've had quite this many people ever at a pre-concert talk, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to thank you all for, for being here, and, and hope you stay around for the concert, because we, <laughs> the whole idea, we, we, get to, we, we get you here, and then we give you a, a, a taste. So I would like to end just by, uh, by thanking uh, our two guests and asking them each one who has heard the piece since its creation, Philip, uh, and uh, Rinpoche, who has, uh, is looking forward, just like you, to hear the piece. He's looked at the score briefly. Um, to say, what, what, what is it that you are looking forward to as you uh, look, look forward to the performance tonight, the world premiere? Personally? Yes. 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to enjoying it. Uh, but, but for everyone else, I'm looking for, I hope people get a, a taste and a feeling and an experience of the, not only potentially the beauty of the music, but of the, of the depth and the qualities of the Brahma Viharas. That's what I'm looking forward to. So again, I'm looking forward to hearing it, but also to entering into, perhaps as you're alluding to, that space is beyond the conceptual base and just allow it to be absorbed into my bones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you both so much. Thank you.